on women in energy transition and to lead us in this conversation, in the presentations that follow actually, is Amanda Ellis. She was the former Under Secretary for International Development for the Government of New Zealand, and then she became Ambassador to the UN for the Government of New Zealand, and now she is a director of a major philanthropic uh, organization that's focusing on climate change. Please welcome Amanda Ellis. Thank you, Irene. Kia ora from Aotearoa, New Zealand. It's a great pleasure to be here in the room with so many remarkable women. Women leading a climate of change. This is really the topic of our times, and I am so honored to be able to introduce, to establish our topic, one of the most important women in the region. Her Highness, Sheikha Shema, Bint Sultan bin Khalifa Al Nahayan, who is the president and CEO of the UAE Independent Climate Change Accelerators. So we actually have an extraordinary woman who is leading the climate transition, the clean energy transition in the UAE. She has an absolutely remarkable CV as a business leader, a social entrepreneur, and a published author. Now, it's extraordinary how many different roles she plays. She serves as chair of the Alliances for Global Sustainability. She serves on the advisory board of Yale Center for Environmental Law and Policy. And she has been very committed in founding social enterprises also. Now, in doing some background research, and I was really fascinated, I spent hours looking at some amazing, amazing things that Her Highness has done. And one of them that really stood out to me was in fact the legacy that she has left with her alma mater, Cambridge University. She is featured alongside such luminaries as Winston Churchill and Michelle Obama on the wall at Cambridge University with the following statement. And I wanted to read this to you because it, it sets the scene so perfectly for the critical importance of our panel and the work that we all must do as advocates for the clean energy transition. I quote, it is our collective duty to lead responsibly to create a better world for future generations. Your Highness, please, may I invite you to the podium. Thank you. gentlemen, distinguished guests. I'd like to thank the Global Summit of Women for inviting me to speak today and for hosting this inspiring event. Seeing so many illustrious women gathered together to discuss this crucial topic is incredibly promising as female leadership is critical to ensuring that climate action and energy transition are both effective and equitable. Around the world, women are disproportionately affected by climate change. However, we are also well-placed to be part of the solution. 
Having more women in leadership positions in the public sector and strategic industries allows us to bring our unique perspectives to the table. This has been recognized and demonstrated here in the UAE since the establishment of our nation. Under the leadership of Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan al Nahyan, may his soul rest in peace, my great grandfather and the founding father of the UAE, gender equity was one of the pillars upon which the foundations of our country was built on. His legacy lived on through the actions and directives of my grandfather, the late Sheikh Rifa bin Zayed al Nahyan, may his soul rest in peace, who implemented these values within the UAE's government sector. In fact, it was under his leadership that we saw Her Excellency Sheikh Lubna al Qasmi become the first woman in our country to assume a cabinet position before going on to hold several ministerial roles. Now, the same ethos must be applied as we look to address one of the most pressing issues of our time. Currently, the energy sector is one of the largest contributors of greenhouse gases, with the International Energy Agency reporting it as the source for almost two-thirds of global emissions. Thankfully, many of the companies within this sector have begun the critical work of transitioning to sustainable energy sources. This transition has become vital to reaching our decarbonization targets. Throughout the summit, we have heard and will continue to hear from subject matter experts who are sharing the latest developments in sustainable technology. It's imperative that both government entities and private sector organizations embrace these innovations as they will be the drivers to a greener future. Whether it is investing in emerging climate technologies or simply creating an environment that allows for testing and development, it's important that the steps needed to support this progression is taken. As business leaders, we bear the responsibility of leading by example and demonstrating our commitment to mitigating the effects of climate change. Part of this is creating a platform for the voices of future generations within organizations and communities, men and women alike, to be able to share their perspectives on the challenges they face and the opportunities they see. As we collectively look to deliver on our sustainability goals, be it in the UAE's commitment to achieving net zero by 2050 or your respective national targets, I urge you to consider how we can collaborate and explore new avenues while also keeping inclusivity at our core. Climate, climate change after all, is a borderless challenge. And as active stakeholders in the Earth's future, we are all responsible for protecting the environment. We must all do our part as stewards of the planet that we call home. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Highness, for that inspiring address, which provides the perfect segue. Female leadership is critical to ensure that the energy transition is both effective and equitable. A perfect transition to our three wonderful women panelists, who I would like to invite to join me on the stage, 
I'm going to quickly set the scene and then introduce each of them more fulsomely just before they speak. So we have with us today from Engie, Claire Waysend, if she could please join us. From Baker Hughes in the USA, we have Maureen Carlson. Thank you, Maureen. And from Oman, Najla Al Jamali. So these are three extraordinary women who are absolute superstars. They are change makers, they are catalysts for positive, sustainable futures. Now, yesterday we started with a pretty depressing series of facts from Sonia from McKinsey. She quoted the latest International Panel on Climate Change report. She reminded us that the UN Secretary General has called Code Red for humanity. And of course, Greta Thunberg, the young climate activist from Sweden, who sparked a worldwide movement, Fridays for Future, reminds us we should be acting as though our house is on fire, because it is. And yet there is still time. This is the decisive decade. And Sylvia Earle, who at 85 is one of my icons, who is the co-chair of Mission Blue and a very famous scientist, says this decade is the most consequential in the next 10,000. This is the decisive decade for action. And the incredible women who are with me today are the ones who are leading the transition to sustainable energy. And the good news is that renewable technologies are now cheaper than fossil fuels. So we are on the cusp of a new era, a new era of sustainable energy that will help create a cleaner, greener, and better world. So I couldn't be more excited to moderate this amazing panel. So I'm going to begin with Claire Wayland from Engie, who is the company's executive vice president and general secretary. She has also held a range of other roles, including acting chief executive. Uh, she has spent most of her career working for the French government, chief of staff to the minister of finance, a deputy director in the prime minister's office, deputy director general in the treasury, and has also been uh, a director of the European Investment Bank and worked at the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, which was across the road when I worked at the World Bank. Those IMF uh, scientists, chief economists and scientists uh, do a fantastic job in really bringing the economics, the economic case for why we need the transition. So Claire, love to hear from you. And then we are going to wait until everybody has spoken for questions. So please begin to write down your questions. This is going to be a fascinating Q&A session. But Claire, we'd love to hear from you. Would you like to come to the podium or shall we have a... Okay, perfect. Well, good morning. Good morning, uh, ladies, many ladies and few gentlemen. Uh, it is a great, great, great pleasure for me to be talking here today, and uh, I'm particularly honored to be talking after Her Highness. So thank you, thank you for this incredible introduction. Uh, and very, very happy to see so many bright, so many committed women in this room. And this is very good, good news, this, this is very comforting, because we will need all of you, and many more, to indeed succeed in the fight that we need to collectively fight, which is the fight against climate change. So let me share with you a few, a few remarks on the topic, both on the urgency indeed and on the way forward. So first, 
you were talking just before about a decade for action. I will be even more precise. When you look at what is in the report of the IPCC, which is the reference in the area, it's not even a decade that we have to act. We have three years to act. So the, the next few years will be absolutely key for our future. What, what is at stake, by the way, is not planet Earth. What is at stake is humanity. It's about our ability to live normally on this planet, our ability to live peacefully together. So action is key and time is of the essence. Second, second remark, if we don't act, women will be the first to suffer. And this is already the case. According to the UN, when you look at climate refugees, women represent 80% of them. Why? Because they are very often the ones who are responsible for collecting food, uh, growing, uh, grow, growing vegetation, uh, feeding animals, in short, the one responsible for the basic needs of the family and most severely hit in geographies, such as the Mediterranean area, Western Asia, many parts of South America, Africa, and Northeast Asia as well. So we're talking about a global issue that strikes women particularly. The good news, because there is a good news, <laughs> is that by now I think almost everybody is aware that we need to act. So how, how, do, we, how do we act? How do we get there? Clearly, energy transition will require an absolutely massive effort. Uh, massive effort in terms of actors. We need countries to act, we need cities to act, we need corporates to act, we need citizens to act. We need all of us to act and to help to play our role in decarbonizing the planet. The amounts at stake are huge, are humongous. We're talking about money of the order of magnitude of $4,000 billion. Probably doesn't tell much to all of us, but $4 trillion every year to achieve what we need to achieve every year in the next few years, the world needs to spend $4,000 billion on energy transition. So clearly it will have to be a joint effort because a lot of this money will be private money so we will need a joint effort between the private sector and the public sector. And of course, as is obvious to all of us, the carbon trajectory of this planet is the result, is the addition of all trajectories of all of us across sectors, across countries, everywhere. So yes, Europe is a leader in energy transition and in Europe, we have set ourselves a goal of diminishing by 55% our greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 on the path to carbon neutrality in 2050. But clearly, we will need collective action and not, uh, not just a few, uh, a few countries. So what will, what will it require? I think on this, everybody is quite convergent. Two things. One consume less. This is about energy efficiency and this is about sobriety. It may seem weird in a part of the world where energy is abundant, but we will need to get used to producing, consuming with less energy. That's the first, first way to achieve transition. Second, we will need green energies. Green energies that will, that will have to be adapted to the realities be they geographic, not all geographies have the same assets, or be they technical. A lot of the energy transition will go through electrification of a number of uses, but we will also need gases. We will need gases to become green. Green gases for heavy industry, green gases for heavy mobility. And the good news is that, the, in particular, renewable hydrogen is very versatile. You can transform it in almost any molecule, uh, adding carbon 
So you can, you can build e-fuels, you can build ammonium, you, you can build e-methane, you can reuse infrastructure. So hydrogen will be key tomorrow in the transition. We will need both electricity, green gases, among which hydrogen. So what do we do and how do we approach the, top, the topic at NG? First, a few, few words about NG. We are very present in this area, but not just. Uh, we, we are present in 31 countries worldwide with roughly 100,000 uh, employees. <clears throat> we, we do have, uh, in terms of electricity power production uh, capacity installed, we do have 100 gigawatts uh, of, of uh, uh, installed capacity, of which 38 are renewable power. So gigawatt may not be, uh, may, may not be uh, familiar to anybody, but let's, to everybody, let's say one gigawatt is uh, a, a bit more than 300 uh, wind turbines, okay, or uh, uh, 1.3 million of PV panels. So that's, that's a big capacity, uh, but of course we need many, many, many more. We are organized across activities which reflect our belief in what will be tomorrow the energy sector. So renewable energy, that's one. Flexible means, because we will need flexible generation in the system, be it battery, be it storage, uh, be it uh, peakers, uh, peaker CCGTs, working with green gases to address the fact that renewables are intermittent. We also have networks, of course, because we will need networks, both gas and electricity to transport and distribute power. And finally, we work on what we call energy solutions, which are solutions adapted to cities, to, uh, to, to corporates, to help them decarbonize. And we ourselves aim to reach carbon neutrality by 2045, uh, relying on all, all the scopes, meaning all the emissions, be they direct or indirect. And most importantly, we are run by a woman. <laughs> <laughs> and this is my, my last point. We are very strong believers, and that's why I'm so happy to be here today. We are very, very strong believers that diversity is key, and that this part of humanity that's here in, in the vast majority in this room, and that just accounts for half humanity, is absolutely essential to energy transition. We need diversity, we need the women, more broadly diversity, but the women's perspective, the women's sensitivity, the women's ability to address complex topics, not to hide away from them. We need all of your talents. So my last, my last plea is really to all of you. Uh, all of you as, well, the ones, the professionals you are, but also because you all have sisters, you all have friends, many of you have daughters, and that's true for men too. We need women in energy transition. So please join, join me, and I wish with this every success to the summit and of course to the COP28. <laughs> We need women in the energy transition, absolutely. And I love this idea that it is countries, it is corporates, it is citizens, it is all of us that can play a role. I was an absolute climate despondent when I left my role as ambassador to the United Nations, having negotiated the Sustainable Development Goals. Despite the breakthrough of the Paris Agreement, which really was landmark in December 2015, when 195 conferences to the party of the United Nations Framework Climate Change Agenda came together to make a commitment to create a better world. And I was thinking, how on earth can we do that? I was looking at the statistics, $4 trillion a year for change, and I'm an economist. But I have some really good news. The IMF data from 2020 demonstrates that fossil fuel subsidies, subsidies, direct and indirect, are 5.9 trillion per annum. 
So in fact, the cost of the green transition is actually cheaper. And that is fantastic news. Obviously, we need to get rid of those distorting subsidies, and we need to factor in externalities. But this is a really important data point, right? The way to a better, greener future is actually a cheaper and better way. And as an individual, thinking about what Claire was saying, how can we create change? So I live in Hawaii, which was 95% dependent on the old energy system. And a visionary, Hank Rogers, who in fact, have you seen the Tetris movie? He's Mr. Tetris, it's a really fun movie. Uh, Hank actually encouraged, with the help of young people in Hawaii, the legislature to commit to 100% renewable energy. They had no idea how they were going to do it, but they made that commitment. And just a few years later, we're at 39% renewable. So what is it that we can get? How do we get countries? How do we get legislators to act? And then we have the corporates, and you're going to be hearing from two more amazing women leading corporate action, public-private partnerships. And then we as citizens. So can you put solar panels, if you live in a sunny place, can you put solar panels on your roof? Can you get an electric car? Can you have battery storage? We do, and I'm so excited, we're carbon neutral in our house now. So with that, I'm delighted to introduce a woman engineer who is also uh, an MBA business expert. So Maureen Carlson, who heads Climate Technologies Solutions and Global Sales at Baker Hughes in the United States, is going to tell us a little more about the business opportunities and the partnerships in a whole range of new technologies. And I think, Claire, it would be wonderful to help us understand, uh, as we heard from Claire, hydrogen can really be a key, and of course we can make hydrogen from renewal technologies and then use it to store. You're also going to tell us about carbon capture utilization and storage and geothermal and clean integrated power. We can't wait to hear more. Claire from Baker Hughes from the United States. everyone. It's wonderful to be here. So I wanted to start, I'm going to give you a little bit of perspective of what it's like to be in an energy technology company. But I wanted to start with a couple of items to make it real and right now. So Claire mentioned three years, three year, the next three years are critical. I wanted to tell you kind of how we're doing. So the good news is um, renewable power has increased 9.6% uh, just in the last year worldwide, which is wonderful, wonderful news. I think we got yeah, right? <laughs> However, there's a downside. When we look at coal fire generation, that increased 6.6% over the last year, right? And to meet our goals, we need coal generation to reduce by 8% every year. So that's a big disconnect. And for those competitors out there, we're losing, right? But why? What, what, what happened here? So a couple things that are really important that we understand. Number one, natural gas prices went up dramatically because of the conflicts in the world. And what, the, what does that mean? Well, co the coal production, that had to go up to, to counteract. So everything that we do to to learn about each other, to increase diversity, to, to decrease conflict, helps the environment too. The second thing that happened that increased the coal production, so more, more renewables went online, which is a really good thing, but we're still learning how to deal with renewables and stabilize our grid. So when it's, when it's sunny, great, it's producing like crazy, but when it gets cloudy, the grid, you know, the power goes down. And how do we deal with that? Well, we have to ramp up quickly. And so we're learning about the grid. 
So and that's the importance of technology, right? So I wanted to kind of explain just today what is happening because we, want it, we, we need to make some changes. Um, so I don't know if we have the slides that are going to come on or not. Um, but let, let me take a step back into energy technology and I just want to bring it a little bit back towards the relevance of women. Um, so when I graduated college in 1999, there was less than 10% women in my major, mechanical engineering. Um, that was kind of a while ago, 1999, although I still feel young. Um, but that was, you know, kind of surprising, right? In, in the energy space, it's, it's, um, it's quite low, the percentage. Um, now at Baker Hughes, we are making huge efforts to promote women. And we talked a little bit about quotas yesterday. It's necessary because when I go out and try to hire people, I can't find women. So it is very difficult. So there must be, you know, requirements so that we're forced to find and search and pull people from maybe different industries because we need that different perspective. Um, so, so again, it was less than 10% when I graduated. So now women in the workforce in my energy technology company, there are 19% women across, which I'm very happy about. I know it still sounds low, but it's greater than the 10%. 18% um, women in our leadership, um, and 33% women on our board. And so very, very proud of that, and it has been many, many years of efforts there. I also wanted to give you the perspective that, so I actually, I'm from the US, but I'm living in Italy. And um, our company manufactures most of its very uh, highly machined, machine, high, very large machinery for energy um, in Italy. And um, I, I recently went over, I've been living there for about a year and a half, and I have had many men come up to me and say, thank you, because I bring a different perspective. And I'm often asking, why can't we do this? Yes, I think we can do this. And, and I'm just kind of, I'm breaking, and I'm, I, I didn't even realize I was doing it. Right, but just kind of being myself, right, and saying, no, we can do this. Uh, so I've, it's, it's, been a, it's been an interesting journey. Um, so I did want to tell you a little bit, and I don't know, okay, so there's, there's the slides are up. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. So just a little bit about Baker Hughes. We are in over 120 countries, 55,000 employees. Um, we focus very much on our safety, that's the HSE days. So what, the way we, we think about safety, and this is gonna be really important in the future as well, every day must be 100% safe day. And that's what we go for, so no injuries. And, and as we think to the future and to using different technologies and to using, let's say, hydrogen, we also think that we're focused, focus on 100% safety. And that knowledge from the energy industry is gonna be very critical as we move into the, to the future. Um, wait, just one, one more thing that I wanted to um, also emphasize. So we invest over $500 million per year in R&D. And that R&D goes into the new technology. But what my team is, what my role is, is I'm, I'm sales. So I'm responsible for telling the company, yes, I'm going to deliver this quarter so that we can continue to invest $500 million in new, in new energy technology. And that's the importance of partnerships, like we talked about, because 500 million is not that much compared to how much money is needed, but we need to make sure that businesses can still keep going and still invest in that money, that money in the R&D. Okay, if you go on to the next. So we talk about the three hard truths of energy transition, and we talk about this a lot and reflect it with our company a lot on this. So the first one, Without major acceleration, we're not gonna make it. And you know, I heard a great, um, an, a great analogy uh, just the other day about it. It's like we're, we're, we're a puppy chasing after a bus. And we're, we're doing great because we, you know, we're going faster and faster and we're growing and we're growing, but that bus is taking off. And we're just watching it go. And it's, you know, it's, it's disheartening when you think about it like that. But when I think about the connections that are being made here and the impact that women can have in that different perspective, we can be the boost. We are the, we are the hope and the boost to get to that bus. So again, it's, a, it's, it's very inspiring to be here. So the second truth is that we need hydrocarbons. We do need oil and gas for the time being. And like I said before, coal went up, 
because natural gas prices went up and we couldn't produce enough natural gas. Natural gas does reduce the CO2 emissions by about 50% compared to coal. So there will be this transition, and it's very important to think about efficiency. So we talked about reduction, right? We need to consume less. We need to be more efficient in, in how we make energy. So that's the second piece. And the third piece is about collaboration, which is what's happening today. We must, we must collaborate. We must work together. Uh, so if you can go on to the next slide. So I just wanted to walk you through the, the four categories that we focus on as a company uh, that we're investing our money in. So there is carbon capture and utilization. So this is where really for the industries that are very hard to abate, the ones that will in their processes um, still produce CO2, we must find a way to reduce that. And that's when you capture it and put it away. And, and you can either use it, utilize it, and, or, um, or put it into the ground. And in certain situations, actually keep it in the ground and make it solid so that it will never, ever leak. And there are some also instances where you put it deep enough where it's going to stay. So we're working on technologies that capture it from, you know, just from, from the processes, but also that work to put it into the ground. And, and just to give some context, the oil and gas industry has actually been sequestering CO2 into the ground for over 30 years. Now, they haven't been doing it to keep it there necessarily. They've been pushing it in to more efficiently get out oil. But they know and understand CO2 going into the ground. And that's a lot of learning that's happened over 30 years. So this is not new. Um, so that's actually it's a, it's a good thing. Now, when we go to the next piece is hydrogen. So hydrogen is also something that the industry has known for years, and Baker Hughes has been working in hydrogen for 60 years. So this is not something too new, right? There's a lot that's already known. What we're working on today is we're testing materials, advanced materials in hydrogen so that we can reduce the cost of producing the green hydrogen. And that's important when Every, every dollar counts because it's right now, why, why aren't we using hydrogen right, literally right now? It's just because it's too expensive, because it's clean. It would, it, we would be using it. In fact, back in 2007, I used to drive around a hydrogen-powered car. It was my company's car, and you know, I used to drive around, and I would fill it up just like a normal gasoline. It, just, it felt like a normal, but I was putting hydrogen into my vehicle, and the exhaust was just water droplets, pure water droplets that were actually clean enough for us to drink. We did, I didn't drink it, but it was clean enough for us to drink. And, and that was back in 07. So why? Why are we not doing this now? It's clean. It's because it's too expensive. And that's why we need the, the, the technology development. Um, this is just some examples of, um, okay, I'll go on to this. So in terms of each company and cor the corporations, we all are making commitments to finding our net zero targets. And I just wanted to share a little bit about what we have done as a company. So we have actually reduced our CO2 emissions by 23% since our baseline of 2019. And, and how is that done? It's literally by every employee making commitments on doing things differently. And it's as simple as turning off the lights or putting automatic lights in to putting solar panels on our roofs but 23%, that's, that's a lot, right? And, and we're really committed to it. And this is actually gets back to, and you can, you can go on to, yes, to, the to the next slide. It gets back to every, every person's commitment. I talked about safety in the beginning, but we're also committed individually to making sure that we're reducing our emissions as well. So it is a lot about our diversity inclusion um, programs because we work together for that as well as the sustainability. So I just wanted to kind of give you some flavors of what, of what we're working on, and you know, I'll, be, I'll be happy for questions a little bit later. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. An important reminder about that conflict and climate intersect. We've all seen the prices go up with the war in Ukraine, and this idea of efficiency, collaboration, and diversity all really mattering. Now, my great honor to introduce Najla Al-Jamali, who is the Chief Executive of Alternative Energy OQ from Oman. And similarly, 
to the story that we just heard from Maureen. Very few women in these kinds of senior positions, and yet we know that this diversity of thought actually brings about better outcomes. So, Najla, we know that you have held a, an amazing number of roles, starting with upstream oil and gas, and now having moved in 2020 to set up OQ's alternative energy team. And you were really instrumental in transitioning it to a business line becoming, before becoming the chief executive in 2022. So we're really interested to hear about the role that you played. And I know that you've been a member of the board of directors of a number of companies as well. So we're looking forward to hearing your journey. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much, uh, Your Highness, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I don't often uh, get to speak in a room where the majority are women, so it's very refreshing. Um, a few things maybe that is not on my CV. I'm a single mother and a sole breadwinner of my family. Uh, I have three beautiful children. Sometimes they drive me up the wall. Uh, I tell them sometimes that they're, they're the devil's spawn. Um, <laughs> but they're lovely. Nobody tells them that, please. They'll be very, very upset. Um, I am from Oman. That's the second question people usually ask. Are you sure you're from Oman? And I say yes. Is your mother also from Oman? And I say yes. In fact, my mother uh, was illiterate, so I would always remind my, my children whenever they come to ask for help with their homework is that I never had somebody help me with my homework. In fact, my mother went to night school and she'd come home and we'd have to do her homework for her before she went to school. And, uh, so it's a, it's a privilege um, in this region for us to be this accomplished it, in a, such a short space of time. Um, with that, I'll start to speak about OQ, but before that, uh, I think one of the things we face a lot in this region is some kind of a mistrust in our intention towards climate change. Um, that it's a, a form of, let's say, greenwashing. Uh, and I think one of the things is important to, to realize, and especially you know, coming from Oman, for us it's not uh, just words. Uh, I've had to be evacuated from my home uh, in October 21, literally 11 p.m. at night. There was another cyclone coming in and the police came around and said, you have to leave now, you, you cannot stay, because I, I live very close to the beach, about 500 meters away. So it's not, it's not a, a nice PR stunt, it's something that we actually want to do because we see that uh, important for our resilience as a country and our, and our future growth. Uh, and the same story then resonates again into OQ. Uh, and with that, I'll begin. Can we have the presentation on, please? Okay, brilliant, thank you. Uh, OQ, I'll speak a little bit about OQ. I won't take up too, many, too much of your time in terms of slides. Uh, who is OQ and drill down into my own business. Um, so we are a global energy transition enabler. Um, the last couple of years made us really look back into our business and really look at what do we want to do in terms of longevity? What do we want to do to go forward? Uh, we are across 17 countries. Uh, we span the entire value chain from upstream, downstream, uh, midstream, uh, trading, and then alternative energy. Uh, we speak a lot about hydrocarbons. What I mean by hydrocarbons is oil and gas for whoever that is not part of the industry. Uh, we are looking always for synergies between our businesses, and uh, we have about uh, products that sell in about 80 countries. Uh, if we look at our business lines, the easiest way is to look at them into three business lines. Uh, upstream, which is the exploration and the production of the oil and gas. Downstream uh, and trading, which looks at then refining and selling and trading that. And then we have a third business unit, which is alternative energy, and I head up that business unit. Um, and you can see here kind of a, a diagram where we feel, although we're looking at you know, dirty versus clean, we see that there's a synergy because it allows us to create this bridge where we can create resilience for our existing businesses within oil and gas, but also ensure that they become cleaner to the extent that they can and less emitting. And then we can set up our, our pathway and kind of that leap into, into growth. 
Um, and this is very important. The more we look at what's happening in terms of conflict around the world, especially in the last couple of years, we realize that energy security is important. And in order for us to ensure the continue, continued supply of energy to the world, you, we must still do a bit of both until we can transition. But in, order, in, the, in that transition, we, will, you know, we need to try as much as possible to ensure that we limit that environmental uh, and climate damage. And so if I look at what are we doing in OQ? Within OQ, we have last year successfully, I managed to uh, get the decarbonization policy approved by our board, which then sets us up for uh, our future. Resilience uh, in terms of uh, our existing business and growth. And that is literally looking at four different pathways. The first two pathways are, let's become more efficient. The, you know, we don't, we, we spend less, we burn less, it's a no-brainer. It's about 30% loss uh, savings that you're going to have in terms of emissions, and then there's a bonus savings in terms of costs. So that's being efficient across our, our, our businesses in, that are in existence. The second set is let's switch as much as possible. Uh, our upstream and, up and downstream, wherever they have power needs, let's switch them to clean. So at the moment, for example, and I have a slide on that, is that we're switching some of our downstream assets, we're switching some of our fields, uh, into renewable uh, energy. We've also been so uh, successful in our strategy that the government has now decided that we will also be the renewable champion for industry and for oil and gas. So where they need to decarbonize, they'll also be coming to us to do that. The third thing is where we're all very excited about and the world is excited about is green, green uh, molecules or let's say low carbon molecules and that's where we see pathway for growth. Not only is it a pathway for growth, it also allows us a pathway to look at our downstream products, which are things coming out of our refineries and say, okay, what can we do to make them uh, more environmentally friendly? And, and uh, let's say, I would say more blue, where we say blue because we were able to capture some of that carbon. And then if we are not successful to decarbonize through being more efficient, turning to clean energy, going to green molecules, then lastly we'll be looking at negative emission technologies. So we see these are the fourth pathways to, to get us to net zero by 2050 as OQ. Um, we've been in the news a lot with regards to green hydrogen. We play a, an immense a role within Oman. We've announced a number of projects. They amount to about 30 gigawatts of renewables going to green hydrogen with uh, investments that total uh, about $40 billion. We do that, we believe in going into partnerships. Uh, that not only allows us to uh, bring in technology and know-how within the country, it also allows us to bring in foreign direct investment into the country, sparks the economy, starting a new sector. It's, it's very exciting times for us. Uh, I'll also then digress to our renewables. As I said, what we're doing within OQ is looking at our existing assets. So if I look at, uh, for example, we have a, a plastics plant within our downstream complex. Hopefully in the next couple of years that will be powered uh, partly through solar. We have a block, block 60, which is an oil and gas block uh, that is looking to switch out all its diesel engine powered uh, power plants to solar plus the grids. So again, we're reducing our carbon footprint. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that's it that I have in terms of our uh, OQ. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Just those key messages of efficiency, the both and in the transition, and the fact that the pathway to growth is green molecules. But also very exciting to see the storage. I didn't understand, as someone who had not done science like these brilliant women, that in fact, direct air capture, pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere, was invented over 20 years ago. We have a center for negative carbon emissions at the Julianne Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory. And the scientist who invented direct air capture, Klaus Lochner, has now just invented passive direct air capture. So we have a mechanical tree on campus 
that actually just using solvents and the air is capturing carbon. It's a thousand times more potent than an ordinary tree. So it's so exciting to know that you brilliant women are leading all these positive solutions. So yes, it's doom and gloom right now, and we know that women, as Claire said, are 80% of the victims of these increasingly accelerating climate crises. But we also know that women have been at the forefront of solutions since the first scientist to discover the correlation between increased carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and warming. Way back in 1856, Eunice Newton Foote. Yes, it was a woman. Of course, a male co-opted it, but we have just been uncovering this and realizing it was a woman who first identified this. And our incredible panel, introduced by Her Highness, and led by these wonderful visionary leaders are showing us today that women are at the forefront of positive change on climate and committed to uplifting other women and to future generations and our planet. So I could not have been more excited when Irene generously gave me the opportunity to lead this brilliant panel. We have time for questions. We would like you to please come and Speak, come to the podium, fabulous, look at this. Excellent, please identify yourself and say to whom your question is to be addressed. Thank you. Quick questions and quick answers, says boss Irene. Yes. Gopgan from Thailand. I would like to know about nuclear, nuclear power plant. Is it still on uh, the map, roadmap of energy security? Okay. So Question about nuclear. Is nuclear still something that we can be using? Yes, uh, yes, it's working. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, yes, short answer is yes. Uh, well, nu nuclear energy is low carbon, so that's, uh, that's, of course, a big plus in energy transition. Uh, it comes with its challenges. All, its, all energies come with challenges. This one comes with the issue of waste. Mm. Uh, but certainly in terms of carbon emission, it can be part of a solution. Great, thank you. Next question. Salam alaikum. My name is Victoria Seyririn from Iceland. The house is burning and this is our only home. I'm going home. Uh, I want your advice, one per woman. How can I help to put out the fire? Thank you. I, I would start by your own home. Look at energy efficiency. It's, uh, it's an easy way to be more efficient in your home. Switch to a renewable source. Uh, those are two easy things you can do. Sorry, you've got two there, more than one. Start with your own home. And in Iceland, you're lucky because you're already at 100% renewable energy and powered by geothermal. And it is a woman who is the CEO. I was just there last year. So amazing to see it. And Iceland is also storing carbon through a company called Carbfix for the last 15 years, sequestering it in the geological substrate where it turns into calcium carbonate and is sequestered permanently within just two years. The solutions are there. Maureen. I'd just like to challenge us on that because that is a great question. But when I think about my personal footprint, what does it is my travel. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So somehow we need to fix that because we need to keep talking and meeting like this because it is incredibly powerful. So I ask everyone, let's think about how do we fix aviation? Yeah, and we have an electric plane flying between islands and Hawaii. 100% renewable, and we also have this recent investment by Lanzatech, again a woman CEO, which has now sustainable aviation fuels. How do we ramp that up? Last week, yes. Yeah, and fully, fully sharing what both the, my, my two uh, co-panelists just said. Third thing, promote action to others as well. Great, mm -hmm. thank you. Claudia Fried from the United States, here, Yael Green, Your Highness, thank you for your inspiring, brilliant message, and all of you. Girls in science, education, and language. I heard today incredibly powerful statement. Mm -hmm. I would also encourage you, all of us, to think about climate change, but climate restoration. 
Thank you. Climate restoration, very important as well. Yes. Um, my name is Francesca Frank. Um, uh, Your Highness, honoured speakers, I would like your comment on a moonshot project. We all know that the sea levels are rising, and for a year I've been connecting desalination professors and companies already in renewable energy to lower the sea levels um, by desalinating with renewable energies and also helping to refill the aquifers. And there are already companies out there that are able to do that, and I think the region here could take a leading role the desalination professors say you need 50 times the desalination capacity that we have today in order to lower the sea levels by 5 millimeters a year. And of course we have all the flood damages from people fleeing from rising sites, um, from rising rivers and, and the seas. So I would love your feedback if you could be part of a movement to you help lower the sea level that? with renewable energies. Well, if you look at green hydrogen, it is made from water. You need a, a, a large sums of water to desalinate and put them into electrolyzers. That's uh, one way to, to mop up some of that water. And by the way, to make it green hydrogen, the, the desalination plants also have to be uh, powered by renewable energy. So that kind of fits in to some extent. I'll leave it. Yes, and uh, indeed des desalination is, is a big, big topic. At NG, we are working, we have we are active in desalination. Uh, we believe here, we are working on desalination, we have plants here. Uh, we believe this is an activity that will be key in a world that's hit by climate change. And of course, one of the big challenges is to green desalination. So indeed, to have green energy sources, to have sustainable desalination. And here, we not only have plants, we also have research. Our Center for Excellence on Desalination oh. is here. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Tess Mateo. Hi, yes. Um, I invest in women-owned green economy businesses for the last 10 years. And I was wondering if you're corporate. I like to invest in spin-offs that corporate support. So for instance, Auto green technologies, are there opportunities or do you have existing programs that help launch new businesses? And particularly women in the room can own this business. For instance, I invested in the first woman-owned EV charging station in the United States. Woo! And, but she was a spin-off off of a utility company. So I was one, and, but, and the opportunity came from the utility company. So I was wondering if, if you have any programs such as that, because I would love to invest in any of them. <laughs> Uh, we don't, but I'm interested in your story. If we can replicate something like that within Oman, within our society, that would be Great idea. Yes. I would like you two to talk afterwards, please. Amalia Asfour. Hi, I'm Dr. Amalia Asfour, Chair for Partnership of Business Professional Women International, but I am also a member of the Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance, leading the private sector as the President of Africa Business Council. In Africa, we are the most affected, but we are only responsible for three percent of carbon emission. While the big industrial countries are the ones who are really responsible, the big countries they have already pledged to put hundred billion dollars for climate adaptation, but it was not realized. So we are really uh, looking for, and we have organized during the COP27 in Egypt in Sharm el Sheikh a high-level panel for empowering women in climate and renewable energy, green economy, and blue economy. So how are your companies really working towards realizing the climate justice for women? And we'd like to thank Her Highness Sheikh Hashema for her uh, presentation. And we are really looking forward to see how United Arab Emirates will capitalize on the COP28 in order to have a high-level panel for empowering women in in really renewable energy climate justice. What a great idea. And of course, having a woman leading COP28 here in UAE is so exciting. Quick answer from each. And then Irene, I know we are right on time. We're going to have one last question to finish and we'll just be two minutes over. Yes, please. Yes, yeah, so quick answer. Indeed, Africa is, uh, is very badly hit by climate change. And I mentioned it earlier. Uh, it's a key issue for governments to come indeed during COPs with solutions for the countries that are the most affected and don't have by themselves the means. On the corporate side, what we can do and what we do is contributing to solutions, one, and second, everywhere, promoting what we call a just transition. Mm. So being active in energy transition, but also being mindful of its impact on populations and being always attentive to the fact that he, at the end of the day, we are serving men and women. And that's, by the way, at the core of our purpose. 
having a positive impact on the planet and on people. Thank you. And I would just like to say, I'm going to follow up with you afterwards because I have an idea. So thank you. And very last question to finish. Yes, thank you. My name is Monica Andres. I work in Yara International, that you know is the global trader of ammonia, that is the main carrier of hydrogen. Um, Europe launched a Fit for 55, so it's a reduction of 50% of the of the greenhouse emissions in Europe for the uh, uh, target in 2030. That is a strong signal. Yes. But the strongest signal has, uh, has come from North America with the Inflation Reduction Act. Yeah. To implement that uh, best available technology that is needed in order to fund the, trans uh, the transformation of energy, we, we will need all heavy capital expenditures. How do you see uh, the rest of the world will meet these targets? With this that's funding? a very big question. Can anyone, and that's true, the Inflation Reduction Act, a great signal, $360 billion, Europe's commitments. Does anyone have a quick comment? Well, I think the answer comes from this room. <laughs> Starts with this room. I mean, we, you, you are from all over the world. Uh, certainly some big players have, have started and sent strong signals. That's the case for the European Union. That's the case for the US. Some, uh, some countries are taking commitments, uh, but, well, you were mentioning earlier the fact that, uh, I mean, th th there is a growing number of coal plants in some parts of the world. So we, we have to be candid and clear about the fact that it's now the responsibility of all countries to come with solutions and to curb emissions, yes. all countries. So please bring this back to your country. And that was also going to be part of my answer to what can you do as voters, as citizens, please do promote the fight against climate change. A perfect note on which to end the importance of country action, of city action, community action. We as citizens, and reminder, as Her Highness said, the transition must be both effective and equitable. And I would like to finish, conclude this brilliant panel of women change makers by quoting Her Highness again. It is our collective duty to lead responsibly, to create a better world for future generations. Please join me in thanking these amazing women change makers.